And he said, you got the job, Bryce. He said, that takes a load off me. So from then on, I prepared the last meals. I guarantee everything will, will tickle your taste buds. I mean, it's everything we have is, is good down-home cooking. And this is exactly the way James Beadhart served his meal. Fish fillets. Catfishing is uh, very popular in the state of Texas. And I felt that that particular execution, I wouldn't be able to do it with the conviction that I had for the others. My name is Brian Price, and I am the Death Row Chef. The Death Row Chef. In 1989, Brian D. Price found himself imprisoned after a heated domestic dispute with his ex-wife escalated, resulting in her assault and the kidnapping of his brother-in-law. The unfortunate incident cost him 14 years of his life, landing him in the Walls Unit Prison in Huntsville, Texas, where executions were carried out. As with all inmates, Price was assigned a job during his incarceration, and he was placed in the prison kitchen. One day, the usual inmate responsible for preparing the last meals for those on death row was unable to fulfill his duty. My name is Brian Price, and I am the death row chef. During their last weeks on death row, the inmate would be given a last meal request, which I have here. I was a musician and a photographer, and they told me, well, not any longer, now you're in the kitchen. I was gonna do it with all my heart, all my passion, that I could put into it as if it was someone that, that I loved. Imagine what's going through their minds. This is my last meal on this earth. My name is Brian Price. I'm originally from San Antonio, where I was born in Texas. The prison staff approached Price, asking if he would be willing to step in and fill the role. Though they couldn't force him, Price agreed to take on the somber task. He made a heartfelt decision to treat each last meal as if it were being prepared for a loved one, someone he cared deeply for. With this mindset, Price aimed to make every last meal the best it could be, despite the limited resources and ingredients available within the confines of the prison kitchen. In 1988, I was a professional photographer and professional bass player in different hard rock bands. Now I came to Huntsville, Texas the first time and ended up spending 14 years here. I went to prison in 1989 on a 15-year sentence. And when you arrive in prison, they assign you a job. In short, I was convicted of the sexual assault of my ex-wife. I was, will ask you, uh, what was your job in the free world? So I told them, hey, I was a professional photographer and a professional musician. And they just laughed. They said, well, not anymore. So you're a cook. Do prisoners get what they request? The Texas Department of Corrections maintains a policy that the last meal requests for death row inmates must be prepared using items available in the prison kitchen commissary. As a result, extravagant requests are substituted with similar, more accessible options. For example, if an inmate requested lobster, they would receive a piece of frozen pollock instead. Prison cooks would try their best to make the pollock resemble a dish from the outside world, such as washing off the breading, cutting it diagonally, and dipping it in batter to mimic a meal from Long John Silver's. In 1994, the prison stopped serving steaks, so when inmates requested one, they would receive a hamburger steak with brown gravy and grilled onions. And I would start putting the ingredients together, whatever I was going to need on the day of the execution. I items prepared ahead of time if I could. When I volunteered to be the last meal uh, chef or cook, I was going to do it with all my heart, all my passion. I guarantee everything will, will tickle your taste buds. I mean, it's everything we have is, is good down-home cooking. There's no health food here in my place. We, I use all the fat and the sugar and the salt. I learned to cook for my mother when I was young. My mother was, uh, like I do here, we have uh, what we call down-home cooking. Although the press would report the inmates' requests as they were submitted, the prison cooks would receive the handwritten meal requests three days in advance which allowed them to consult with their superiors on how to fulfill them using available resources. Despite these limitations, the cooks managed to do quite well in providing satisfactory last meals. Inmates would be served their last meal two hours before their execution. However, the once appetizing meal, such as a burger and fries or a bacon, lettuce and tomato sandwich, would ultimately be reduced to stomach content on an autopsy report after the execution. The cooks, recognizing the gravity of their task, always tried to do the best they could with what they had, aiming to provide a small comfort to the inmates in their final hours. Last meal for this guy, here's what he wants. And I was standing there, I said, what? What was that all about? He was the one cooking the last meals mainly back then. I said, oh, they're going to be an execution tonight, you need to prepare the... I said, the last... he said, it's the last meal. He said, we do those down here. I said, you're kidding. You know, if I want to be around something like that. But he said, oh, just watch what, how I do it. 
And so uh, I was watching Terry how he uh, prepared everything. Well, the next day when I went into uh, work, my captain called me in the kitchen. I had a few reservations about it. I don't know how I really felt about it, but I decided that I would try to do uh, the very best that I could. The requests from the prisoners. Despite the constraints, Price tried to satisfy the inmates' last meal requests as much as possible. If an inmate requested lobster, he would make do with frozen pollock, carefully breaded and seasoned to resemble a dish from the restaurant like Long John Silver's. If they wanted steak, they would get a hamburger steak. After preparing his first last meal for a convicted murderer, Price, a devout Christian, prayed over the meal, asking for the Lord's forgiveness for the inmate. The next day, Price received word from Sergeant Cook that the executed inmate had sent his thanks, expressing gratitude for the well-prepared meal. This had a profound impact on Price, who realized that this might have been the last bit of appreciation the inmate had shown to anyone in this world. So Price decided to take over the responsibility for preparing the last meals for death row inmates. From 1991 to 2001, he prepared 218 last meals in the state of Texas. Contrary to what one might expect, the most frequently requested last meal was a simple cheeseburger and french fries. Price would make homemade buns for these monster burgers, which brought comfort to the inmates in their final hours. Of course, there were also some unusual requests. They just had the prison food, and when they request something uh, for their last meal, most of the time it's something special. Fix and be executed. I wanted to have the very best meal possible. And with what expertise I had, I tried to do just that. No, no, I was never able to witness them. I was never able to speak firsthand to any of those that I prepared the last meals for. So he was thanking me, but through the captain, my captain, who would tell me, he says he thanks you, Brian, and uh, really appreciates what you've done. One inmate asked for dirt from the grave he would be buried in, which was a part of a voodoo ritual. However, the prison provided yogurt instead. One day, Price was stumped by a last meal request for scotch eggs. No one, including the captain who had a long history in culinary arts, knew what they were. By sheer coincidence, when the afternoon supervisor came in, he was asked about the mystery dish. Amused, he explained that he had seen scotch eggs featured on Good Morning America just the previous week. The recipe involved boiling an egg, wrapping it in sausage, dipping it in pancake batter, and then deep frying it served with syrup. With this newfound knowledge, the kitchen staff attempted to prepare the unusual request for the inmate. After tasting the dish themselves, they found that it wasn't to their liking, but they remained committed to fulfilling the unique request for the condemned prisoner. Price explained that inmates could request whatever they wished, but they wouldn't necessarily get it. The prison would ensure that the amount of food provided was reasonable and something the inmate could finish before meeting their maker. Death row inmates, they did not have a, a choice of whatever meal they were going to have every day. That I do for the fish, and it's the same breading basically for uh, the onion rings. It's cornmeal and flour. Thanking me for the meal and saying how much he liked it because he hadn't had food like that 15, 20 years maybe. Here they have a, a choice. I'm dipping these fillets in the milk and egg wash. Let most of it drip off. They've been soaked once. I'm going to lay them. You know, and he look at me and say, man, he killed all my kids. How could you do that? How would I face him? And I said, yeah, I cooked him a great last meal, Ernest. Something they haven't had probably in two decades. The practice stopped. However, in 2011, the state of Texas stopped allowing inmates to choose their last meals after an incident involving white supremacist gang member Lawrence Russell Brewer. This decision deeply upset Price, who had since been released from prison, married, and was running his own restaurant. Brian Price, a former inmate and prison cook, offered to pay for and prepare every last meal for condemned inmates himself after Texas announced it was ending the tradition. Price believed that justice would still be served when the person was executed, but he urged the state to show its softer, more compassionate side by continuing to offer last meals. The last meal request by killer Russell Brewer was the final straw for some in Texas. Brewer was executed on September 21 for his role in the racially motivated 1998 dragging death of James Byrd Jr. His last meal request included an extravagant list of items, such as two chicken fried steaks, a triple meat bacon cheeseburger, a cheese omelet, a large bowl of fried okra, three fajitas, a pint of bluebell ice cream, a pound of barbecue, a slab of peanut butter fudge, a pizza, and three root beers. However, Brewer didn't eat any of it, not even a single bite. Texas State Senator John Whitmire found it extremely inappropriate to provide such a privilege to a person sentenced to their death when their victim wasn't granted the same luxury. 
Texas prison officials agreed with Whitmire and immediately halted the tradition of allowing inmates to choose the menu for their last meal. Figure that up. 40 executions in one year. What does that divide into, into 365? And this is exactly the way James Beathart served his meal. What is that, one about every eight days or so? I was a very busy man. Okay, well, now the chicken's ready. Once again, golden brown. We got fried crappie ready to eat. Fresh out of the frying pan. Fish fillets. Catfishing is uh, very popular in the state of Texas. Price disagreed with this decision, stating that it showcased Texas's cold-hearted nature. He acknowledged that most of the inmates had earned their place at the execution table, but emphasized that his offer would not burden Texas taxpayers. Price was familiar with the uneasy feeling of preparing meals for death row inmates, as he had done so himself during his 14-year prison term for assault. Initially, Price researched the crimes committed by these inmates and questioned his ability to cook for them. However, his perspective changed after talking to Manny Lopez, a fellow inmate responsible for cleaning the death chamber after executions. Lopez revealed that the most difficult part of his job was cleaning the witness room, where the inmate's family watched their loved one die. This conversation led Price to imagine the inmates as his own family members, motivating him to cook for them as if they were his own kin. However, it appears that Texas will not accept Price's offer. According to Texas Department of Criminal Justice spokesman Jason Clark, the state is not concerned about the cost of the last meals, but rather the concept itself. Initially, Price supported the death penalty, but his experience cooking last meals changed his perspective. He now sees capital punishment as a dark and tragic practice. Price wrote about his experiences and the nearly 200 meals he prepared in a book titled Meals to Die For. In telling Price's story, we explore a unique perspective on the death penalty and the human connections that can be forged in the most unlikely of places, the simple act of preparing a last meal for a condemned criminal. That's all for this video, folks. See you another time.